A century of Earth's radio transmissions has now washed over thousands of other star systems, carrying with it some of our greatest broadcast masterpieces, as well as our worst reality TV. What are the chances that alien civilizations have detected and even decoded these signals? We are a young technological civilization. An advanced alien race monitoring our planet, even from the nearest neighboring star, would have seen nothing. Radio quietness, until only around a century ago. Then, beginning with the faint sporadic buzz of the first experiments with wireless transmission, the radio brightness of this small planet would have bloomed into a continuous planet-wide cacophony of TV and radio broadcasts, satellite relays and radar pulses. This bubble of chatter is, as I speak, spreading out into the galaxy at the speed of lights, the unmistakable signature of an emerging technological power. The outer edge of this bubble is now over 100 light years away, and it carries with it the first transatlantic radio transmission of Marconi himself. That edge may be hopelessly diffused, but it's followed closely by the much brighter 80 light year shell on which rides the footage of the 1936 Berlin Olympics, episodes of The Lone Ranger, and Orson Welles' ill-fated radio adaptation of War of the Worlds. That shell has washed over several thousand star systems, based on Kepler Space Telescope observations that also means thousands of potentially habitable planets. Lots of chances for hypothetical civilizations to have learned of our existence. So the question is, who could have seen us? What manner of civilization would be powerful enough to sense this bubble? What tech level would be needed to actually decode the signal it carries? If aliens arrive on our doorstep tomorrow, would they have been alerted to our presence by Nikola Tesla's first experiments, broadcast footage of the moon landing, the Phantom Menace? To answer the question of who can see us, it's helpful to first ask, who could we see? After all, humanity remains the one example of a technological civilization for now. Our best astronomers have been engaged in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI, in earnest since the 60s, when Frank Drake first peeked at the stars Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridani. Drake peered into the so-called water hole, a narrow frequency range in the radio spectrum between a pair of H and OH emission spikes which itself is within the broader window from 1 to 10 gigahertz. There, the natural universe is especially quiet. Surely this is the window where aliens would choose to broadcast their messages welcoming us into the galactic community. And of course, Drake saw nothing. Decades of SETI programs followed, utilizing several of the world's great radio telescopes, like Arecibo in Puerto Rico and the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. These searches often focused on the waterhole, or the surrounding quiet frequency window. But with the exception of some one-off oddities, the search was not successful. The 1977 WOW signal is the most compelling, a narrow frequency radio blast detected in the waterhole that still has no broadly accepted natural explanation. But no one ever saw it again. Apparently no one is trying particularly hard to get our attention, and it's important to understand that these searches could only have been successful if there were deliberate, powerful beacons emitted by an alien civilization. The radio leakage produced by their own internal broadcasts would be much harder to detect. Our best targeted search so far, the SETI Institute's Project Phoenix, scanned 800 stars within 200 light years. At that range, it could have picked up a gigawatt beacon beamed directly at us. But it would only have picked up leakage from a civilization's internal broadcasts from within a couple of light years, if those broadcasts were the same strength as our own. In that range, there is exactly one star, ours. An alien civilization at exactly our current tech level would never have seen our TV bubble. We have sent out more powerful beacons, like the stream of 10,000 tweets and celebrity videos that Arecibo blasted in the direction of the WOW signal. But that's a long shot. 
and perhaps for the best. I'm not sure we want our first contact to be a typical slice of the Twitterverse. One of the reasons it's hard to spot unintentional radio leakage is that a distant civilization's radio bubble is likely to overlap in frequency with our own transmissions. This is another advantage for searching for alien signals in and around the waterhole. At around 1500 megahertz, it's in the ultra-high frequency UHF band. Most TV broadcasts are at the tens to hundreds of megahertz of the merely very high frequency VHF band. VHF works better for over-air broadcasts because it carries further and is less blocked by buildings and such. So we often search the UHF to avoid the thick soup of our own VHF chatter. But surely aliens are working with the same physics that we are. Perhaps we miss each other because we can't easily peer through our own local VHF soups. But there is a way to peer straight through our own radio noise as though it wasn't there. The answer is interferometry. Two radio telescopes separated by a large enough distance can filter out local transmissions. A signal that appears in one but not the other must be an earthly transmission. Now that's not the main purpose of interferometry. That is to increase the spatial resolution of your observations. You get the resolution of a telescope as large as the separation of the component telescopes. Also super useful. Interferometry has been around for a while, but we're only now building an interferometer facility with the sensitivity to potentially see an alien TV bubble to many light years. And that is large enough to filter out local noise. It's the Square Kilometer Array, or SKA. The SKA is actually many, many telescopes. Arrays of thousands of radio dishes will be built in Africa and hundreds of thousands of antennae installed in Australia. When connected up, it'll effectively form a giant radio telescope with over a square kilometre surface area. But as an interferometer, it has the resolution of a telescope thousands of kilometres across. Its sensitivity and pinpoint resolving power will be vastly greater than any telescope of any type that we have ever built. The SKA is not being built to search for aliens. One of its primary purposes would be to catch the radio emission from hydrogen gas in the extremely early universe. That emission, produced at 21 centimetres wavelength, or 1420 megahertz frequency, is by definition one of the boundaries of the waterhole. But if such radio waves travel to us from the earliest of times, then they become stretched out as they travel through an expanding universe. That redshifted early hydrogen emission is now found slap in the middle of the noisy lower frequency part of our own TV broadcast spectrum. To spot these radio photons, we need a truly gigantic interferometer, both for extreme sensitivity and to eliminate our own radio buzz. That's the SKA. Such a machine also just happens to be perfect for spotting alien television bubbles. According to the calculations of Harvard University's Avi Loeb and Matthias Zaldariaga, the SKA should be sensitive enough to spot our own TV bubble from 100 or more light years away. So will we soon be picking up extraterrestrial sitcoms? Not quite. Loeb and Zaldariaga's numbers assume pointing SKA at a target star system for an entire month and adding up all of the radio emission over that time. For an artificial radio source that would look like emission over a narrow frequency range that doesn't correspond to any natural process. These emission spikes may also shift back and forth in frequency due to Doppler shift as the distant technologically advanced planet orbits its star. So that's enough to identify a technological source, but not to actually decode the signal. An alien civilization with their own SKA certainly couldn't watch Earth TV. To do that, they would need to achieve SKA's one month sensitivity in a tiny fraction of a second. That means compensating for the difference in exposure or integration time with sheer size of the telescope. Let's figure it out. What would be needed to say tune in to the first season of the original Star Trek series? That signal is now 50 light years away. Assume a bit rate of 10 million per second for a miserable 30 frames per second at 200 by 200 resolution and only 8-bit color. Forget audio, 
which is a shame because the original series dialogue is awesome. The aliens would need a radio telescope trillions of times the SKA's surface area, and equivalent to a dish around three times the radius of the moon's orbit. This is perhaps conceivable for a Type II civilization, although it's exceedingly unlikely that there's one of those within our radio bubble. We may even be a little optimistic in thinking that the SKA will detect alien TV. As the SETI Institute's John Billingham, along with James Bedford, point out, that one month integration time requires a very consistent narrow frequency signal, which may not be consistent with typical broadcasts. But remember, humanity is young as a radio noisy civilization. Simple probability says that any other civilization is likely to be ahead of us on the curve. It's not hard to imagine them building a much larger SKA without going full type two. Our SKA will cost a few billion dollars by the time it's done in 2030. That's a significant investment, but only a tiny fraction of the global GDP. For a slightly more advanced civilization, that's several Moore's Law doublings ahead of us in various technologies and accounting for moderate GDP growth over a century or two, a super SKA with several hundred square kilometers of collecting area would constitute the same degree of investment as our own one square kilometer array. In that case, Earth's TV bubble would be spotted within hours or even minutes of aliens pointing the facility to our solar system, even if they weren't looking for us. Surely any advanced civilization is curious about its own origins. That redshifted 21 centimeter hydrogen emission really is one of the most important keys to understanding the very early universe. It's pretty natural to want to scan the heavens at exactly the frequencies where we earthlings are the noisiest. If there's a slightly more technologically advanced civilization within our radio bubble, they've probably seen us. However, our steady broadcasts have only washed over a few hundred solar type star systems and only a few thousand stars total. Technological civilizations would need to be extremely common throughout our galaxy, and I mean tens of millions of them across the Milky Way, for there to be any chance that there's another one so close to us. But we just don't know. If anyone else inhabits this very local region of the galaxy, then they may have been aware of us for some time now. Any civilization within 40 to 50 light years could have sent a return signal that will reach us any day. Their fleets of welcome ships will be a little further behind, but no doubt carry only the best wishes for their noisiest neighbors in nearby space-time. Hey everyone, I just wanted to say thanks again for those of you sponsoring us on Patreon. I want to give a very special shout out to Lunar IT Solutions, who are sponsoring us at the Quasar level. Thanks a ton, it really is a huge help. A couple of weeks ago, we leapt back into black holes and studied the nature of the event horizon. You guys had some excellent and quite tricky questions. Lucasino asks what we would really see if we followed the monkey directly through the event horizon. Would it appear ahead of us despite previously appearing frozen on the event horizon? Well, sort of, yes. The light from the instant of the monkey's crossing of the event horizon is eternally trapped at that horizon. It's trying to walk upwards on a downward escalator of space-time. But you're traveling down that same escalator, and so you pass this light. And so you see the instant of the monkey's crossing. The escalator speeds up as you descend, and so light that the monkey emitted from below that point is trying to go up, but is actually going downwards. And yet you're traveling downwards faster, so you overtake some of that light which means you see the monkey ahead of you. Douglas Oak asks a great question that I've heard asked before. If time dilation approaches infinity, do you reach the singularity before the black hole evaporates? Okay, so a distant immortal observer with a ridiculously good telescope will detect photons from the falling monkey at all future times. Eventually those photons will come billions, even trillions of years apart from each other and be hugely redshifted. For an eternal non-leaking black hole, there is no last photon. But real black holes decay, 
And so the final burst of Hawking radiation as a black hole evaporates will be accompanied by all of the remaining light emitted by everything that fell into it as it crossed the event horizon. But the infalling stuff isn't saved. Although we never saw the moment of its crossing, that did happen. Its matter became part of the black hole and re-emerges as that Hawking radiation. Grin Reaper of Trolls is curious about taking their warp drive into a black hole. Well, I would encourage it. You can escape a black hole by traveling faster than the speed of light. In principle, you can do that with a warp drive. The probably impossible technology of the warp drive allows you to cause a patch of space to move at really any speed you have the energy to reach. So you could resist the faster than light flow of space within the black hole. The event horizon itself just wouldn't apply within your warp bubble. You know, there's probably a Penrose diagram for this. I'll look into it. Some people complained about my use of the expression escape velocity greater than the speed of light at the beginning of the episode. First, let me note that I gave that statement in a list of popular examples of oversimplifications about black holes. Second, it's not actually an incorrect statement. Despite the derision it receives in nerd circles, it's accepted to talk about the escape velocity at the surface of the Earth because we're used to Newtonian approximations there, but it's no less accurate near a black hole. At the event horizon, you need to travel at the speed of light relative to the black hole's stationary frame of reference as recorded by a distant observer. That's the velocity you need to escape. The reason that people poo-poo the expression escape velocity is that it reminds us of a strange coincidence. You happen to get exactly the right size for the event horizon if you use Newtonian gravity to calculate the distance at which the escape velocity reaches the speed of light. The correct way to get this number is by using general relativity to find the point where the flow of space-time reaches the speed of light, but the concept of escape velocity at the event horizon is still as meaningful as it is from the surface of the Earth. It's a useful classical simplification in both cases. Corner Record asks about that thing when you're in a black hole and time becomes space and space becomes time. Well, that's probably a topic for an entire video, so for now I'll just quote, what's his name? The inward direction acts like the future direction. So once inside the horizon, avoiding the singularity is like avoiding next Tuesday.